Okay, in this video we're going to talk about one last crucial part of limits, which is the squeeze theorem, also known as the sandwich theorem in some schools or countries. It has a bunch of different names, but the concept is all the same. If we have three functions, where f of x is less than or equal to our function g of x, which is less than or equal to the function h of x, when x is near some point a, then we have an interesting circumstance. If the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x, which is equal to some number l, then the limit as x approaches a of the middle function g of x must be the same limit. Why? That is the big question. So, it's a nice little demonstration. We have our three functions. I will give them three different colors. f of x, actually I'll pick a point a, and I'll pick a limit l, so it should be roughly here. We have a function f of x, which is the smallest function, so it's going to be below everything else. It's going to touch a, and then go down wherever it wants to go. We have a huge function, which is our h of x, which is bigger than the other ones. So it's going to also hit A at that point. And then we have our middle function, which is between the two functions that touches A at the same point. There we go. This is our G of X. What we're saying is that if the smaller function and the bigger function are at this limit point at A, then the middle function must be at that point too, because the middle function is essentially squeezed in between our bottom and top function. So I'm going to in, like introduce one example. I'll do one practice problem that's very, very similar to that example for you guys, and then hopefully you'll understand the general gist of the idea. There's not many practice problems you can do with this, but the idea is very important and can save you with a very difficult question in the limit practice video coming next. So keep this in mind. So here's your one example. Hopefully this will make sense. Some of the methods I'm using aren't going to be that well understood. As a first year calculus student, it might be a little bit difficult to grasp. That's totally normal. This was probably the hardest part of the first month of the course in Calculus 1 for me. So don't expect you to grab this mathematically right away, but the concept should make perfect sense. And if not, you might want to review the beginning explanation and maybe understand the math a little bit, take some time, go over that very carefully. So we're going to find the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x. Okay, so you plug x equals 0, you get 0 times sine of 1 over infinity, which is equal to actually you get sine of 1 over 0 which you can't do so you can't plug this into there because then if you try to make it bigger or smaller you get sine of infinity and sine of negative infinity and what does that mean we have no idea so we can't do anything with that so we're going to start smart and we need to find functions f of x that's smaller than sine and h of x that's bigger than x squared times sine of 1 over x so we're going to start with our main function, sine of 1 over x. In fact, I always recommend starting with the trig, placing that in the middle, and then finding its upper and lower bounds, and then multiplying by whatever else you have and figuring out what's going on. So we know the sine of 1 over x graph has a minimum at negative 1 and a max at 1. How do we know this? Okay, well here's a graph of sine. Starts off at 0, goes to 1, negative 1, 1, and it keeps doing that forever and ever with reaching 1 at the max and negative 1 at the minimum. This 1 over x just sig signifies the period. So this does not change how high it goes, it just shows you how fast it's going to 1 and negative 1 again. So these are the lower limits, so this is going to be our f of x, and this is going to be our g of x. So now we have to deal with this x squared out here. So let's multiply everything by x squared. So negative x squared is equal to x squared times sine of 1 over x, which is less than or equal to x squared, because we just multiplied negative 1 by x squared and 1 by x squared, as well as sine of 1 over x by x squared. Now let's take the limit. 
Well, the limit as x goes to 0 of negative x squared is equal to 0, and the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared is equal to 0, and because f of x and h of x equals 0, our middle function must also equal 0. So we can say, therefore, the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x is therefore equal to 0. Because we've squeezed this function in between these two functions. Now this might be a little bit difficult to understand conceptually, so I recommend going over this example again. And once you think you understand it, you can try this practice problem I'm going to pose to you right now. And it follows the same pattern. In fact, pretty much all of these do. So don't be afraid when you get a new question. Try what you know. If what you know isn't working, then either try having a brilliant moment of insight and playing around. It's very important to play around with these kind of things. Or, you know, check out Google, Wolfram Alpha. Your answer key might have a detailed description of what to do. Some of these things are not intuitive. And it's okay if you don't get them. It's just okay that once you do look up how to do it, you practice it and you remember what to do because future things in calculus will have the same sort of ideas and tricks behind them. So it's important to learn these tricks. Okay, enough rambling. You're going to find the limit as x goes to 0 of x to the 4th times cosine of 2 over x. All right, pause the video, see if you can do it, and we'll be back in a second. All right, hopefully you're able to do this. And I'm going to mention this again, as I did before. This inside is the period. This does not affect the maximum and minimum bounds of the cosine function. So what do we know about cosine of 2 over x? Well, just like sine, its maximum is 1 and its minimum is negative 1. Okay, so now let's multiply by x to the 4th on both sides. So we get negative x to the 4th is less than or equal to x 4th times cosine of 2 over x which is less than or equal to x to the fourth. And we're going to take limits. I'm not going to write them up formally, but if we take the limits as x goes to zero, then we're going to get zero is less than x to the fourth cos of two over x is less than zero. And because the lower bound and the upper bound are zero, therefore we know that the limit as x goes to zero of x to the fourth times cosine over two to the x is equal to zero. Hopefully you understood this. Hopefully you got this right. If not, in the next video we're going to do a practice limit. We're going to have a much more difficult limit to look at. It's going to follow the same pattern, just a couple more steps and a couple of it functions that look really, really tricky, but are actually really simple. So practice up. I'll see you guys in the next video where you can do that limit and hopefully things go very well.